All right, so we're um, like right at about two o'clock. I'm gonna wait just another uh, minute here. That's all right, and uh, we will get started. <clears throat> All right, let me turn this on, and of course, I keep disappearing. Okay, <laughs> I think you guys should be able to see my screen now. Um, there's still people coming in, so let's give them just another minute to get settled in here. So we're gonna we're gonna actually cover a lot of material today. Um, I'm going. I'm. This isn't going to take more than an hour. We're gonna. We're gonna cover a few main topics. Um, we're gonna go a little bit deep on a couple of them, and then um, I'll answer, you know, any and all questions that you guys have. Um, you can just put them into the uh, question box or into the chat box, which should be. Uh, Sound went away. How about now? Fixed. Great. Lost audio. It's back. It's good. It's good. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, all right. So, I've called this training the perfect lead life cycle proven strategies for maximizing your sales and your uh, profits. So what we wanna do here is we wanna talk about kind of the typical lead life cycle, kind of where they start and where they end. And then I wanna show you one that is profit optimized or profit maximized, if you will. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about today's consumer, the 2017 consumer. We're going to definitely talk about review. We're going to talk about referrals. We're going to talk about repeat sales and how you can kind of build yourself a system to create more high quality leads, close more sales, and earn higher profits. Uh, Dave Azer, is that you? Yes, it is. Cool. So everybody can hear you and me. We can't hear them. Got it. We're on it. Do you want to say anything before we get started, before I jump into this? Oh, you give me responsibilities too? No. Absolutely. Only if you want it, my friend. Absolutely. I do want to say. And, you know, from what I know in the industry, Brian is the very best at understanding how to drive more referrals and add-ons um, to your business. And he's an expert at doing it. He's also an expert at teaching it. So as much as you can really take the time, take the notes, understand the content, um, it will help you drive more sales um, at your company. So with that, Brian, go ahead and take it away. Cool, Dave. Thank you. And just so you know, um, we can hear you. So if you are doing something you don't want us to hear, you uh, may want to mute yourself out. But jump in anytime. All right, so um, so that's kind of what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover quite a bit, and like I said, I'm happy to stop 
answer questions for you. We also have a resource for you. So Dave twisted my arm into creating kind of a step-by-step -step plan for you guys and um, kind of walking through some of this stuff, particularly on the post-job completion side. So we've given you kind of, here's what to do. We've given you some scripting. We've given you some email templates um, and just some other things. So we'll have that available to you um, after, after this is over. All right, so let's let's dive in here and let's talk about kind of the typical lead life cycle. And this is, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of this stuff is really not unique to home improvement. It's how a lot of businesses operate. But generally, there is all of this activity that happens to create a lead, right? And so a lead um, in this case really is kind of more of an inquiry. Somebody has just raised their hand, called on the phone, filled out a web form, you've seen them at a show or an event, and they've raised their hand and they've said, hey, I'm interested, right? Then it's all about what do we do with that to turn that into an actual appointment, actually something that we can issue to a salesperson to go and run that lead. From the appointment, then we go to the demo, right? So we're either, you know, going to sell the job at the sales presentation or we are not. Now, this is kind of a simplified way of looking at it, but this is really kind of the way that it works. And if we look at lead generation today, and liners, you know, you guys are some of the best in the business at creating um, inquiries, at creating interest, at creating leads, right? But we know that those leads are getting harder and harder every year to get, and they're getting more expensive. They're getting more expensive. And so for me, it's all about how do we maximize the opportunity that already lies within all of the stuff that we're already doing and we're already paying for, right? Because you're already paying for this inquiry here. Now, whether that turns into money for you or not, right? There's still opportunity there for you to do something with it. So this is why I say that there really is a ton of profit opportunity, but what's happening is a lot of it is being wasted. And if, if those of you have seen me before, or probably seen me talk about this before, where it's kind of like the, it's the leaky bucket, where we're putting in leads here up at the top, we're putting them in, putting them in, but then we're letting the opportunity escape us um, and in all different formats, right? So here is kind of the, the optimized way to look at this and to look at where is where are the opportunities for us to make more money, to create more opportunities, to make more sales, right? So if we look at now, if we start with inquiries, okay? So let's say we get 100 inquiries into the business. And let's, for, you know, just to make it simple, let's just say we get 100 phone calls this week, this month, whatever, okay? What percentage of those will turn into an actual appointment, something that you can issue to a salesperson. Well, in the industry, you know, depending on who you ask, that number could be anywhere from 60% up to, some people will claim they're in the 90s, but that's because they're not tracking properly. So somewhere in the middle is the truth, right? And so, Generally, it's somewhere in the 70, 75, 80% range. So let's just call it 75%, right? So 75% of these will turn into an appointment. What are we doing with the rest of them? What are we doing with the ones that don't set? Now, some of them just never will. We understand that. But what are we doing with those people, right? How do we get them to come back and get reengaged with us? Next, the appointment. So we've set an appointment, we've issued the lead to people, right? So we're either gonna run that and make a presentation or we're not, right? So what percentage of those actually get um, to the demo, 
right? Again, there's different numbers here. And again, if we call it 75%, 80%, there is an opportunity there with the people that did not set. They're in our system. We've paid to get them into our system. What are we doing to maximize the value of that lead, right? In the old model, right, they just sit in the database. And maybe, you know, some of you that have call centers, you're calling them, you're calling them, you're calling them, you're calling them. But what else are we doing? Then we get to the demo. Then we get to the demo. So either we sold them or we didn't sell them. Now, depending on your company, your close rate is somewhere between, you know, on issued leads, 25% and maybe 40, 45%, right? So there's a, again, another opportunity for you to do something with those people that did not buy. Now, of course, now, of course, some of you are thinking, well, you know, they'll just never buy. Well, yeah, there's a small group of people. But if you listen to, you know, Market Sharp and the studies that they have done, of the, you know, if we just say that the average close rate is 3 out of 10, of the seven people that did not buy, of the seven people that did not buy, 40% of them, I'm sorry, 60% of them are going to buy within a year. Now, they're not going to come and buy from you. They're going to buy from somewhere. That's four more sales. What if you just got one of those back? Just one, maybe two, right? There's strategy there for it. And to me, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, just hitting them on the phone, the phone, the phone, the phone isn't enough. It's not going to work today. That Those strategies worked 20 years ago, not as effective today as they were 20 years ago. And then the final piece here is at the sale, at the sale. So yes, we get money. We've made a sale, we complete the project, we get money. But there's more money to get. There's more money to get. And so this is kind of some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about here today, right? To how do we do this? So if we don't set an appointment, if we don't set an appointment, what are some of the things that we can do here? So, you know, obviously one is have better scripting, have better methods of answering the phone, making sure that our people that are answering the phones understand that their job is to sell the appointment, not to sell the job, not to sell the company, but to sell the appointment, right? But then what? But then what else? So let's say that somebody doesn't set. Well, what do we do with those people? So there should be a system in place to nurture these people along. You can email them to try and get them to come back. You can send them text messages to try and get them to come back. If they don't come back immediately, and this is what we do, is we're trying to, you know, we hit them with email, we'll hit them with a text. Um, along with the company's call center in order to try and get those people back, right? But then if you don't get them right then and there, what are you doing with that lead? So most of the time, or what are you doing with that person's information? So most of the time, what happens is that just goes into a database somewhere and that database is just kind of, it's just kind of names in a database without any real strategy for staying in touch staying in touch, staying in touch. And that's where, if you look at down here, if you look at number four, that's where long-term nurture comes in. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in just a few minutes. Same thing here with appointments. Appointment, no demo. What are we doing to get those people to come right back? So yes, we wanna use the phone, but also can we get them with email? Can we get them with texting? Maybe even, there may even be an argument for direct mail here. And then again, if that strategy doesn't work, then you drop them into your long-term nurture. Demo no sale, you know. Um, what are we doing to get some of those people back, right? Again, if 60% of the ones that don't buy are going to buy within a year, that's four more sales. For the most part, it's another four opportunities to make a sale. And what are we doing there? So again, we want to hit them with email. 
we want to get back into the house. And many of you have, many of you I know have rehash programs and you have really good rehash programs. But here's what I'm noticing. If you're only using the phone, you're leaving money on the table. You're leaving money on the table. There's other modes of communication to get to these people. Email being one of them and texting being another. And then, of course, see, with this group, there's an argument to also be made for direct mail. There's an argument to be made for direct mail. Okay. Now, when we look at stuff like this, so we built out systems like this um, for, for clients. And this is actually um, a system that was built out for, um, um, for Larry Kloss at, at Max Home. And what we're essentially what we're doing is we are taking each of those buckets of people and we're saying, okay, what can we do immediately to get them back to the call center? Right? So if they appointment no demoed, what can we do to get them right back in? What can we get them to do? You know, what, what do we have to do to get them back into the call center so we can reschedule that appointment? Right? And so we're using email and we're using text to do that. But also, the important thing here too is the long-term nurture piece. So what are we doing in terms of long-term nurture? So here's just some examples of what we're doing. Right? And there's a few things that you got to know about this when you do them. So first off, in terms of long-term nurture, what we're doing is a friendly newsletter once a month. And we follow a proven format with, with newsletters, right? We want to have a message from the owner. We want to have, um, uh, we don't want to load it up with, oh, um, you know, this, the latest, greatest uh, bath technology. I mean, there might be kind of good, but you don't want to load it up with stuff that's all about you. You want to load it up with stuff that's entertaining, that's engaging. So we'll put a recipe in there. But of course, there's always an offer. So you could see that offer right here. It says April sale. This is actually shrunk down a little bit just so I can get more of it onto the screen. But it just goes down and it's just really easy. Lots of images. Um, just really easy um, for for them to look at and it's not aggressive it's not aggressive now with this group of people with this group of people we're talking about people that have not bought from you that are not your customers because you want to treat your customers different we're going to talk about them in a minute but up until now these are people that have not bought anything from us so with this group we want to be a little more aggressive and so what we also do is we send out these more aggressive offer driven emails once a month once a month right now we do some cool stuff with this and I, I don't know if you want me to go into very many details you can call me and I can I can share some of this stuff with you but like all of these these links every link that's in any of these emails the minute somebody clicks this link right here, a message is going back to the call center to say, hey, this person, here's their name and here's their phone number, this person has clicked a link in your email, call them. You know, because we know they're right there. Obviously, though, you don't want to let them know that, hey, oh, you just clicked an email, a link in an email, and so now I'm calling you. That's, that's, that's not good. You don't want to do that. Um, it just want to be kind of spontaneous, but this is this is what you want to look at in terms of long term nurture. You want to stay in front of these people and stay in front of these people and stay in front of these people. And this is all for all the inquiry no appointment people, appointment no demo people, and demo no sale people. All right. Now, a couple of important things that you've got to understand when you're doing this type of lead nurture. These are people that have not bought from you, right? And so, and we're hitting them, you know, fairly aggressively because a lot of, like with Larry, his phone people are calling them, you know, calling them. They're getting emails also. So your opt-out rates on for this group of people is going to be higher than it would be for your customers. But that is something that we say, 
you know, we're okay with because they didn't buy anything from us. Now, we don't want to be annoying. You know, you don't want to completely scare them off. You don't want to be completely obnoxious to where now they're thinking, oh, this company is so obnoxious that we would never do business with them. So there's a fine line there um, between obnoxious and aggressive, all right? Opt-out rates are going to be high. The other thing here, too, is that your spam complaints are going to be high. So you've got to be really careful with the providers that you're using to deliver these emails that you are um, following certain guidelines, can spam guidelines, so that they're not shutting your system down and basically locking you out. All right? So that's the first three groups and I thought it would be important for us to spend a little bit of time there because there is so much opportunity there sorry there's so much opportunity there that it would it's a shame to let all of that opportunity go because if we you know look at the numbers by the time how many leads in your company do you have to go through in order to make a sale a sale you know for some companies it might be three or four for some companies it might be seven eight nine ten and depending on the type of inquiry or lead that it is is going to be a little bit different right so a show lead is going to set at one rate um, a, an internet lead is going to set at a different rate a nebulous lead right is going to set at a different rate so regardless there is an opportunity there because there is a leaky bucket. We all have them. They're in every business. Now, it's not unique to you, right? This is in every business. And so the thing what we've got to look at is can we set up a system? Can we put a system in place here to maximize that opportunity there? And there are ways to do that. And you could simplify it. I mean, just in your system or whatever CRM system you're using, all you've really got to do is just have a category. If you're using lead perfection, let's say there's a disposition. So the disposition could be long-term nurture. So after they go through a certain number of, of uh, times that you're reaching out to them, have your uh, call center, whoever is dealing with the database, mark them as long-term nurture. And then what you do is you take that group of people and this is the group of people that you'll send out your monthly email to. These are people that you'll send out your monthly offers to. And you'll just need to create three or four emails a month and, you know, and then just select those people and boom, shoot the email out to, to those people. So do we have, um, are there any questions about any of this so far? I'll wait for a second to see. All right, it doesn't look like it, but if there is, just put just put the email in there or just put the question in there. Let's talk about after the sale now. Let's talk about after the sale. What can we do to get more reviews? Reviews are, we're going to talk a little bit about it here in a second. Reviews today are critical. They're not even important critical to your success. What do we do to get more referrals? What do we do to get more repeat sales? And how do we use the relationship with that customer to aid in all of this? All right. So post job completion. So today's consumer, today's consumer is, uh, is probably, you know, a little bit different for those of us that have been in business for more than 20 years, we know they're a little bit different. We know that they're better educated than they've ever been. There's this thing called the internet. They can go on the internet and they can find all kinds of things on the internet, right? They have more options. They have more options now than ever before. And there's also now this ability for them to talk to each other in a way that they couldn't do before. Even five years ago, it wasn't what it is today in terms of online reviews. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the stats with you guys. You already know. 
you know that 90 plus percent of people are going and they're looking at reviews online. They're looking at how many you have and how many stars you have. The more stars you have, the more um, leads you're going to get. The more reviews you have, the better you're going to place on the search engines and the more likely you will be to get that lead and the more likely that is to help you in the sales process, in the sales conversion part. Okay? So you, you've got to not only focus today on your product, but you've also got to focus on your customer experience. Now, we cannot talk about referrals. We cannot talk about repeat sales. We cannot talk about reviews. We can't talk about any of those things until we talk about the customer experience. And today, you've got to completely differentiate yourself from everybody else out there. You've got to show up different. You've got to be all about the customer. In home improvement, you can't rely on the, you know, quote unquote, magic of your product like this guy can, right? Apple relies on the magic of their product to, to make sales, right? We can't because our products are available pretty much by 10 other people in our marketplace, right? And so what we've got to rely on is we've got to rely on the customer experience. That's where the differentiation comes in, is how do you represent yourself to your prospects and to your customers? How does your company look in relation to everybody else? Do you look the same or do you look different? Right? It's all about the customer experience. And so today, it's really not about satisfied customers. I, I happen to believe a satisfied customer is a liability today because a satisfied customer um, is not really going to be excited about going online and doing the things that they have to do to leave you reviews, are they? A satisfied customer is not going to go out of their way to brag about you at work to their friends. A satisfied customer is not going to be excited about necessarily having you back into their house for more work. But a raving fan, now a raving fan, will be thrilled to go online and write something good about you. They won't be able to wait to get to work to brag about, oh my God, you wouldn't believe the experience that we had with bath wraps. You would not believe the experience that we had with, you know, you fill in the name of your company here. That's what we're striving for. Now, can we turn every customer into a raving fan? No, it's not practical. But here's the thing. Here's why I say that a satisfied customer is a liability. Because if your system is set up, if your system is set up to create a satisfied customer, and let's call it, you know, this is the continuum right here. This is raving fan. This is pissed off, angry, ugly customer. Your satisfied customer is somewhere in the middle of that, right? And if your system is set up to only create a satisfied customer and your guys are off one day or your people are off one day, what happens? You know, they shift over this way to the not so happy side. But if you have a system in place for creating raving fans, right, and maybe you don't have the best of customer, or maybe you can't, you just went out of your way, you can't please this customer the way that you would like them to, and you're a little bit off, where are you? You're still in the territory of, wow, we're, you know, wow, these guys really were very different. That's where you want to be. That, having a system for a satisfied customer, again, is a liability. And if that's where you are and you're wondering why you're not getting more online reviews and you're wondering why you're not getting more referrals and you're wondering why you're not getting more repeat sales, that's probably a big part of it. Okay. By the way, you know, one of the things that, you know, people ask all the time, well, what percentage of my business should be repeat and referral? Well, I will tell, I'll tell you this, you know, I, I, I can't give everybody a definitive answer, but 
at least what you should be shooting for is 35 to 40 percent. It's where you should be, about a third of your business. Now, I have clients that are upwards of 70 percent. I have clients that are, you know, struggling to get anything at 5 percent, right? But 30, 35 percent is a great target. Now, think about how would how different would your business be if a third of the leads that were coming into your business were from some relationship you have with your past customers? Would your lead cost be higher or lower? They'd be lower. Would your close rates be higher or would they be lower? They would be higher, right? Would you make more money? Yes, you would make more money, right? So today, it's, you know, we've all got great products. But it's not so much about the product as much as it is, you know, the solution that you're providing to the customer, but also the experience that they have with your company. Okay, and I can't stress this enough. You know, if you don't have this piece in place, you could send people gifts, you could ask them for referrals, you can ask them to go review you. Truth of it is, they're not going to want to do it. They're not going to want to do it because they just weren't that impressed, right? So we talked a little bit about this. You know, what, what, what you really want is you want to have your customers out there marketing and selling for you, right? When they're out there marketing and selling for you, that's, you know, lower lead cost, better quality leads. You're going to sell more jobs and ultimately you're going to make more money, right? Now, one of the things too, and I think that you guys are probably all really good on this, is premium pricing. You know, you should all be figuring out your pricing so that you've got a minimum, minimum bottom line of 10%, minimum 10%. You know, now I know companies that are upwards of 20%, um, or, you know, thereabouts, floating up there. This is, by the way, by the way, without the owner's salary. The owner's salary is in as a, uh, a general and administrative expense. It is not bumped into profit. If you have to pay, uh, if you'd have to pay somebody to do the job that you do in your business, whether it's sales, it's production, it's marketing, or it's management, that goes in the top. It does not go down to your bottom line. The bottom line is after everything and everybody has been paid for, that is the net. And the net should be a minimum, minimum 10%. Right? So with, in order for you to create raving fans, you've got to have a few things in place. One, you've got to have trust. You've got to have value. You know, you've got to be the best value, not the best price. You've got to be the best value. You've got to have a great customer experience and you've got to develop that relationship with the customer. Okay, so trust, value, experience, and relationship. So when it comes to trust, you kind of got to ask yourself, are you there as an annoying pest, an annoying salesperson that's just there about getting the money and getting a transaction, or are you there as their trusted advisor? Are you there to walk them through the process and help them get the solution that's right for them? Right? And so we all know both types of salespeople. Right? And as my contention, and it is you know proven to me over and over and over again, I work with hundreds of companies like yours, that the trusted advisor salesperson is going to outperform um, the annoying salesperson all day long. So they, the customer, needs to feel like I trust this person that this person has my best interests in mind, that this person is not here only for them, that they're also here for me, okay? Trust, right? Now, they also have to have trust in your system. They have to trust that in order for you to get referrals, in order for you to get repeat business, they have to trust that your system is one that's duplicatable, that if they were to recommend you to somebody else, if they were to 
come back and do business with you again, that that experience that they had with you will be the same, if not better. It's not going to be different. It's not going to be worse. It's got to be consistent. If you think about, if you think about the best businesses, the best places that you would either uh, that you would go and uh, like a hotel or um, entertainment or food or clothes, anything, go down the list. You trust that if I buy one shirt from this place and oh man, this is, I love this, this is great quality, it's a good, it's a good product, it came in a nice package, it came undamaged, it came ready, right? That if I order from them again, that it's going to happen the same way again, okay? So that is really important, trust and confidence, right? Value, value. Are you the best value for your customer? Not the best price, because again, I think you guys are all premium priced. If you're not, you should be. But are you delivering great value to your customer? If they feel that they got good value, even though they know that they paid more. Now look, I have clients, I have clients that where it is known, it is a known fact that they are more expensive than everybody else, even though they sell the same product. It's a known fact. And yet, they have people waiting in line to do business with them rather than take a chance with somebody else. They'd rather pay the right price the right price rather than take a chance and pay less and go with somebody that could ultimately not be good for them okay so this is about value the best value okay next is experience the whole customer experience now I'm not gonna go through the whole customer experience with you but here's what I would say to you think about your customers experience think about that lead life cycle have you put yourself if you're an owner have you put yourself through that process have your friends been through that process would you have your friends go through that process what you want to look at is you want to look at all the customer interaction points and you want to look at and ask yourself how do I create a wow moment at this interaction. Ask yourself, what would Disney do? Right? Disney is the best at this, at creating these customer experiences. You could bring that into your business and ask, what would Disney do? So how do I make the phone interaction amazing? Amazing. How do I make that amazing? Well, one thing you could do actually is, and I recommend this all the time, is call this company called Zappos, Zappos.com. Call them. Say, hey, they're an online shoe company. Say, hey, I'm looking for a pair of shoes. That's it. That's all you have to say and listen to how they respond to you on the phone. And then how do you take that and bring that, introduce that into your, into your business? So you've got to look, you can't be stuck in uh, what other home improvement companies do to get your ideas and to get your inspiration. Look outside. Look outside and look to see what other great companies are doing to see how you can bring some of that into what you're doing. Right? Think about every detail of the customer experience because, again, Without an amazing customer experience, forget about reviews, forget about referrals, forget about repeat sales. It's just not going to happen, all right? And then finally, it's really all about the relationship. So are you a transaction thinker or are you a relationship thinker, right? So if you're a transaction thinker, now look, I, I had a company at a home improvement company where we would do we were doing I don't even remember we did hundreds of jobs a month we did jobs from we had a handyman business we did jobs from five hundred dollars up to twenty thousand dollars all right and 
I knew better. I knew better when I started the business because in fact, when we started that company, I started it on the back of one of my other companies. So basically I took my list of customers from this home improvement company and I sent them all a letter and I said, hey, we're st we started this new service, here's an offer, and boom, that was our first two months of business. Okay, that's what got us started, that's what brought in the cash in order for us to keep going and go to the next level. But then, sure enough, very quickly on, what did I do? I got so focused on how many checks are coming in every day that I completely forgot about the relationship with the customer. Completely forgot about it. And what an idiot I was because that ended up costing me, I don't know, I can't even quantify it, but we did hundreds of jobs a month. I mean, I had, I eventually, we franchised this thing with 30 offices around the country. Later on, towards the end, was when I really started to hammer our office and our franchisees with relationship, relationship. We did a newsletter every month. I mean, we just, but it was late. At that point, it was, it was late. I had already lost so much opportunity. We made the change. We, made, we went from 15% repeat and referral to over 50% repeat and referral. But we did that by completely changing our thinking, our mindset, which was all about the transaction to it's all about the relationship. So it's different. It's a different situation when you are thinking transaction versus relationship. Okay? I hope that, I hope everybody gets that. So I'm going to so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go through post job completion with you. We'll talk about thank you, we'll talk about feedback, we'll talk about reviews, referrals, referral program and keeping in touch. And I'm going to give you some best um, best practices for for all of these. I'm going to show you some of the things that we do for for our clients, but I'm just showing to you showing them to you as demonstration, right? Here's, here's what we've learned, here's the things that we do. Copy it, take it, do it, do it however you want to do it. Um, it's, it's fine with, with me. All right? So what we want to do is we want to say thank you to our customers. It really starts with after we have, so think about, think about it this way, again, from customers, from the customer's perspective, all right? So they had you out, your salesperson went in, your salesperson did all kinds of stuff. They, you know, they're their best friend, they're their trusted advisor, they did all of this stuff to get them sold. Right? They got them sold. There's probably a lead time between the time that you sold them and the time that they actually had their new bathroom installed. Right? So one of the things you gotta ask yourself is what happened in between? Okay, but that's part of customer experience. Let's just say you gave them a good experience or you stayed in touch with them, let them know about the process, how things are going. Now it's installation day. Okay, so now you've gone in, they've, you've installed the product, they're happy with their bathroom. So now what? So now what happens? Okay, so at that point, you know, you can ask yourself a few questions. Is the sound still out? Somebody just said lost sound. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Keeps going in and out. Love technology. So, uh, where were we? So, now you've installed the job. Now you've installed the job. So now a couple of things. So one is, what are you going to do now at that point to continue to wow that customer. What are you going to do to get them to give you feedback, to give you reviews? So you could, and I recommend this, on that day of install, you should be there. Somebody should be there, whether that's the salesperson or what we're calling a brand ambassador. Should be there at the job. Walk people through, re-engage them, into, get them excited again about the process, right? And now if you want to ask for referrals, <clears throat> the, 
this is the best time to ask for referrals. When they're in what we call the glow, right? The day it's been installed, they look at it, it's like, wow, my God, I can't believe that you guys did this in less than two days. It's amazing, look how beautiful this is, right? They're excited. But then you leave, okay? But then you leave, and it's the next day. And it's the next day. And it's a few days later. Are they still as excited? Probably not. Are they still as engaged? No. They're starting to forget about you is basically what's happening. Why should they remember you? They got to move on. They got a family. They got a job. They've got bills, right? Go down the list. They got other priorities. They've just written you a big ass check, right? For them, probably a big check, or they've taken on payments now. So every month, they're going to get reminded of that experience. So it's either, you know, think about that one too, by the way. For those of you, I know that a lot of you are pushing financing and you want financing, which is great. People will buy more and they'll pay more. But, but <clears throat> think about something. Every month, you're showing back up again. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Every month they're being reminded about you. Do you want that reminder to be a good one or do you want that reminder to be a bad one? Okay? So think about that too. But a week later, a week later, something shows up in their mailbox, in their mailbox, that says thank you. Now, it could be a thank you card. I've given you an example of one there on the right. It could be a gift box. I've given you an example there on the left, right? You are the most important person in our business. Thank you. We appreciate you choosing us. We know you had a choice, and we really appreciate the fact that you chose us. Show your appreciation. Now, look, you don't have to go through all of what we go through. It's better, but what if you were even just sent out a thank you note? The way that we used to do it was that we would we had a we had a system. The guy would bring in the paperwork. They would go through the paperwork. It would go to um, at the time the, the the service manager. Her name was Sandra. It would go to Sandra. Sandra every day had a stack of thank you cards on her desk, and every day she was writing out those thank you cards. And we did all of this stuff by hand, all this stuff by hand, right? But that's how important it was. We wrote it out, we put a business card in there, and we sent out the thank you card. Now, at the time also, Addie, who came into the business later on and really took on this, Addie is my wife and my, my business partner, for those of you that don't know us, she went around and started visiting with our clients, would take them gifts, would just engage with them. This is part of the reason how we went from you know, miserable under 15% repeat referral business to over 50% because we really started to focus in on this. So we would send out the thank you card. We would do a happy call to see how they're, how they're doing. And then we would put them into our long-term nurture. So we would stay in touch and stay in touch and stay in touch with them, right? Yeah. But it starts with the thank you. Now, a lot of people... And I don't know how else to say it. So I'm going to be straight with all of you. We're all adults. A lot of us cheap out when it comes to this. Right? It's like, oh, I already sold the job. I already got the job done. Why am I going to spend whatever amount of money, even if it's five bucks? Why am I going to spend any money on that customer? Why am I going to spend any money on that customer? That, my friends, is very short-sighted thinking. Because think about how much you paid to buy that customer. Think about how much work and how much money you spent to get that customer, right? In a lot of cases, it's a thousand dollars, thousand bucks to buy that customer, and you won't spend a few dollars more to put a fence around them, right? Think about that. If you have to, if you have to, add one percent to your pricing. 1%. And that 1% covers, covers customer appreciation, 
covers keeping in touch with that customer. Believe me, it's better for them too. It's better. Think about this. It's a week later, right? I've already forgotten about you. I'm using the bathroom. It's fine. It's, you know, it's my, now it's my new reality. I've forgotten about you. But now a week later, a box shows up, a gift, a thank you, something shows up from the company. How does that make you feel? about that company. Does that make you more likely to write a positive review online? Go through, go to Google, you know, log in, go to write a review, write out your review, hit the stars, hit the submit. It's a lot of work, right? Are you more likely to do that now or less? You're more likely to do. It. Are you more likely to go talk to your friends and family and how great the experience was or less? more, right? Are you more likely to want to work with this company again or less likely? You're more, right? Think about these things, okay? Think about these things. This is, these are the little things that are going to make the big difference. So this is customer appreciation. Now, the other thing too is you want to use email. You want to start to communicate with them via email. And so the first email you want to send out is just uh, hey, thank you for your business. We really appreciate it. And we, and here's an example of one that we send out. We want our, we want your feedback. Please let us know how we did. Okay. So what have we done? So we've sent out a thank you, a physical thank you to their mailbox. We have sent out an email to their email inbox, and we've started to send out email communications. Hold on, somebody just wrote something. Get ready. Okay, so look, uh, Diane wrote, and this does not surprise me in the least, Diane wrote, for bath jobs, we send two bath towels, a shower squeegee, soap, and a candle for our completed bath jobs, and get rave reviews from our customers. Of course you would. Of course you would. Because nobody else is doing it. Nobody else is doing it. All right? So, feedback, feedback. One of the things here is that what we want to do is we want to understand how did we do before asking people to go online and post it, post a review. Now, I've looked at some of you, all, not all of you, but some of you, I've looked, and you don't have great online reviews, nor do you have a lot of them. Well, today, you need a lot of them especially if you're doing print media and you're doing TV, radio, anything like that. Of course, that goes without saying with the internet, you know, if you're doing a lot of internet marketing, because people are looking at that stuff. And if you don't have the reviews, that more, they're more than likely not to fill out a form and not to call you than they are um, if your reviews were higher, okay? So you want to ask for feedback first. Once you've got that feedback, you know, what is that feedback? Is it good? Is it bad? If it's good, then you want to have a system that moves them and says, okay, great. You gave us good feedback. Now, would you mind going and posting that on Google, on Yelp, on Facebook, whatever is important to you? Now, I will tell you this. Here's what's important. These are the big three right now, Google, Yelp, and Facebook. Now, I know how everybody feels about Yelp, so we're not even going to go there, all right? But Google is, right now, is number one. you got to have strong Google reviews. Got to have strong Google reviews. You've got to be doing everything that you can to be getting your customers to go and post their positive reviews on Google. Hold up, that right. Google is dead. Dave, did you want to say something about that? No, no, no. Keep on going, Brian. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is just, you know, this is the system that we use. Um, it's our system, Authentic Feedback. But, again, what we're doing is we're asking on a five-star system, how would you rate us, right? So initially we just want the feedback. If they rate us 
a four or five stars, then they're going to go here. If they rate us one, two, or three stars, we don't want to push them out online. We want to fix the problem, then we'll bring them back through the feedback system to ask them again, hey, did you have a good experience? And if it was at this point, if it's a four or five feedback, then you'll want to push them out to uh, – listen all right that's why you got to have a system for creating raving fans not just satisfied customers now again in order for somebody to refer you they have to trust in you and your company they have to trust that you are the real deal and that you're in it for for them not only for you and they have to have confidence in your ability to duplicate the experience. Duplicate the experience. Think about all of the best companies that you know. And one of the things that they all have in common is regardless of where you go, regardless of when you go, you're going to have the same great experience over and over and over again. I don't know how many of you are familiar with In-N-Out Burger on the West Coast, but if you go into that place, it's like it's unbelievable you go into any location anywhere and it's like a fine-tuned clock right fine-tuned clock that's how you want your business to be again think Disney what would Disney do all right now when it comes to referrals aside from all of that you have to ask for referrals okay you have to ask for referrals and one of the best times to ask for referrals is on the day of job completion the job is completed that's when you ask for referrals okay that means you've got to show up you got to be there right and you've got to talk to them about the experience and how it was and all of that and then ask them who they might know who they can introduce you to that's new language by the way that I've been using I've not been asking for referrals I've been asking for introductions introductions all right now one of the things that a lot of companies do is they have a referral program. The problem, though, with the referral program is it only shows up one time. Maybe there's a brochure, maybe there's a piece of paper, maybe there's something and it's stuffed in the compl job completion packet. Here you go, and you know that's your referral program. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but they forget about you. They forget about what you did for them, and they'll refer you get about your referral program like this. It is your job to continually be reminding them about your referral program. Now, this, one of the strategies that we use is we use a contest strategy so that we can continually be going back and talking to them about referrals over and over and over and over again. Every quarter, every quarter, we have a new excuse a new reason to show up and talk about referrals right you can create something like this too what is your reason for going back and asking for referrals you got to constantly be reminding people about who you are the solutions you provide and how to get a hold of you okay so that's with referrals now the other thing I'll tell you with referrals is that you um, if you are if you are I'm sorry I'm looking at the question box here um, by the way if you have questions I know we're coming up on the hour I might have even gone over a little bit uh, but we're just about wrapped up here if you have questions like I said I will be more than happy to hang out and answer questions for you referrals if you have a referral program and you're offering some sort of reward, some sort of offer, which I always recommend you do, and by the way, I always offer the reward for the appointment, not only for the sale. If you want to do a two-step, that's fine too, 
But to me, if they have given you a name and you've set an appointment and you've gone and you've demoed that person, boom, your person gets a thank you. Phone call, email, card. Make a big deal out of it. Make a big deal out of it. All right? Referrals. And then finally, the way you wrap all of this together, the glue that holds all of this together is keeping in touch with your customers. How do you do that? How do you keep in touch with your customers? So you can do this via email, which I recommend. Um, and you should be doing this via mail as well. So what we always recommend doing is having a monthly email newsletter that goes out like clockwork and a quarterly print newsletter. Now these are examples of the ones that we do for our clients. There are certain specific strategies that are embedded into all of what we do here. But the reason why you want to use a newsletter is because a newsletter is a friendly, friendly communication. You don't want to use something that's constantly about give us more money, give us more money, give us more money. That's the big mistake that I see people using with direct mail. You have not developed a relationship with people and it's like you're just coming back to them and saying, well, just because we did your job before, you should give us more money now. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Develop the relationship with people. Send them out these communications. Stay in front of them with email. By the way, by the way, our open rates on email marketing to customers is significantly higher than on non-customers, which you know should not be a surprise. Our opt-out rates are much, much lower, much, much lower, and our complaint rate is almost nil. Okay? So a company newsletter helps you stay in front of your customer. It helps you stay top of mind. It doesn't let you for, doesn't let them forget who you are. Okay? So stay in front of them, stay in front of them. You don't have to do the full-blown newsletter, although that's what we recommend doing. But as a, send them something. If you want to sit and write a letter to them every quarter, a personal letter, do that. Just don't make it something that's all about you, that's all about your products and your services, and all about giving you more money. Because they will just throw that stuff in the trash. You will waste your money, you will waste your opportunity, and you'll come back to me and say, well, yeah, Brian, I tried direct mail and it didn't work. Well, it didn't work because you're not doing it right. Okay? So, um, Dave, I know I went a little bit over. Um, I hope I covered everything that you wanted me to cover. I know there's more, so I'm happy to go a deeper with any of you um, on this. There's my contact information up on, this, on the screen. Um, anything else? Yeah, I just want to add a couple things. So we emailed everybody on this call Brian's complete A to Z system for our state in touch with your customers from the emails to the direct mail and everything in between. And so we really would advise you guys to focus on this issue of how do you stay in, your, in touch with your customers and um, certainly we believe that's going to lead to more referrals and add-ons. Um, one of the notes that I'll, I'll put out there is that um, some companies have found over time that it actually costs them more to manage it than to have a company like G4 manage it because now that's all they do and they leverage that. Um, they manage this for literally hundreds of companies. So if you're interested in staying in touch with your customers but you don't feel you have the resources or the person to do it, I would strongly advise you to reach out to Brian. Um, however, like I said, we did email everybody on this call the A to Z system for reaching out to your customers and staying in contact with them and doing all that follow-up. So I'd advise everyone to, if, if you're not doing this enough, to do one or the other. Really dig into it on your own, assign a team member that job of really owning the process of staying in touch with those customers, or if you don't think you have those resources, at a minimum, call Brian, talk to him. You might be surprised at how inexpensive it is for him to do it for you. 
absolutely. Cool. So it doesn't look like we've got, um, somebody wants me to send them info on authentic feedback. Um, Bernard, I'll be happy to do that. Um, any other questions before we, before we go? All right. You are welcome. Dave, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Very impactful. Right. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later.